Leili uh, Kichitahanska, Leili Long Soldier, Imachiapi, Da Yahipi na Chantewashte na Um I'm very happy to be here. Um, thank you so much, Ine, and everyone at ILI for welcoming here to speak. It really is an honor. I did work with ILI for 11 years, but next year, 2018, will be a total of 20 years since I first started, uh, or started working in the office, which is amazing to me. <laughs> I'm getting old. So. <laughs> happens like that. So, <clears throat> uh, I'm here today, I'm going to uh, share with you, first of all, I feel, number one, very honored to be here, but also, I'm here speaking not as uh, an expert or a teacher, a language teacher, but I am a learner. And as a learner, I am also a beginner. That is what I am. I am a beginning uh, speaker. Um, just one minute. I just remembered something. Uh, so I have brought with me, as a beginner, a sample of some of the materials that I use, Lakota language materials. And you'll see I have for example, two dictionaries there, and a workbook, um, uh, everyday language, a little workbook, and flashcards, and a book on our star, star knowledge. I have many other materials at home, but this is just a sample. Um, I'll get to those, a discussion about those uh, things in a minute. But um, I'm actually going to open up with a poetry reading. Is that OK? OK. Um, so the first thing I have to say is uh, we've passed out packets, one per table. I have no idea what I was thinking. I thought there was going to be like 20 to 30 people here today. <laughs> so I went to. Kinko's this morning, and I made 30 photocopies. So that, there's just enough for one uh, packet per table. But uh, to make up for that, I'm going to project the poems as I read them. So if you can't see the packet, you can follow along. So I'm going to have a poetry reading. And in the, uh, I've selected pieces in which I have used Lakota language. And um, before I begin, I will say um, many of these pieces were written. Uh, when I use Lakota language, I use it because I want to come closer to that language uh, and closer to something of myself. Um, but I am by no means an expert, and I'm always learning. Uh, and so after the reading, I'll talk about a bit about my process, my writing process, some mistakes I've made, um, and how those mistakes have still led to a deeper knowledge um, and appreciation for our language. <clears throat> I've written a book called Whereas, so these uh, poems are selections from that book. I'm going to begin with a piece called Chesapa. Um, do you know what Chesapa is? That is our word for Black Hills. Chesapa. One. He is a mountain as he is a horn that comes from a shift in the river, throat to mouth, followed by sapa, a kind of black sleek 
in the rise of both. Remember, Chesapa is not a black hill, not Pahasapa by any name you call it. When it lives in past tense, one would say it was not red horn, <coughs> excuse me, red horn either, was not a rider on horse on mount, and did not lead a cavalry down the river and bend, not decoy to ambush and knee buckle to 10 or 20, perhaps every horse face in water. Its rank is a mountain and must live as a mountain, as a black horn does from base to black horn tip. See it as you come, you approach. To remember it, this is like gravel. Two, because drag changes when spoken of in the past, i.e., he was dragged or they drug him down the long road, the pale rock and brown, down dust a knocking path. And to drag has a begin point, though two are considered, begins when man is bound, begins also with one first tug. So we take the word to our own uses and say, it begins with his head on the ground, with his hair loose, under shoulders and shirt with snaps, their mother of pearl. Then begins a yank and slide, begins his skin and scalp, begins a break a tear, red to pink, to precious white. Then begins what is his skull, glisten of star to bone. Three. This is how you see me the space in which to place me. The space in me you see is this place. To see this space, see how you place me in you. This is how to place you in the space in which to see. Four. But is the small way to begin. But I could not. As I am limited to few words at command, such as Wambli, this was how I wanted to begin, with the little I know, but could not. Because this Wambli, this eagle of my imagining is not spotted, bald, nor even a nest eagle. It is gold, though by definition not ever the great golden eagle. Much as the gold, by no mistake, is not ground gold, man gold, or nugget. But here it is the gold of light and wing together, wings that do not close, 
but in expanse, angle up so slightly, plunge with muscle and stout head somewhere between my uncle, son, father, brother. But, whoops, but I failed to begin there with this expanse. Much as I fail to start with the great point in question. There in muscle, in high inner flight, always in the plunge, we fear for the falling. We buckle to wonder what man is expendable. Five. Inside the wheels of wrists and hands, a white shore of book and shell, I kneel in the hairline light of kitchen and home, where I remember the curt shuttle of eyes down, eyes up, where I asked, are you looking at how I've become two? This one combs and places a clip just above her temple, sweeping back the curtain of why and how come. I kiss her head, I say, maybe you already know. Born in us, two of everything, as in each born to our own crown, the highest part of the natural head, and each born to our own crown, a single power, our distinction. But I'm dragging myself, the other me, every strand up to the surface. I remember very little. So I plunge my ear into the hollow of a black horn, listen to it speak. Not one word sounds as before. Circuitous, this I know. What's the next in the packet here? Let's see here. Okay. The second part of my book um, In the second part of my book I respond, I have written 28 poems responding to the National Apology of Native, to Native Americans. How many people have heard about that apology? I wonder. Yeah, there's a few, and I think that's great, but there are many who do not know about that apology. Uh, so, just, just for you, I'm going to read an introduction, a little background on that. On Saturday, December 19th, 2009, U.S. President Barack Obama signed the Congressional Resolution of Apology to Native Americans. No tribal leaders or official representatives were invited to witness and receive the apology on behalf of tribal nations. President Obama never read the apology aloud publicly. Although for the record, Senator Brownback five months later read the apology to a gathering of five tribal leaders though there are more than 560 federally recognized tribes in the U.S. So five out of 560 is less than 1%, right? <laughs> the apology was then folded into a larger, unrelated piece of legislation called the 2010 Defense Appropriations Act. 
My response is directed to the apology's delivery, as well as the language, crafting, and arrangement of the written document. I am a citizen of the United States and an enrolled member of the Ogallala Sioux Tribe, meaning I am a citizen of the Ogallala Lakota Nation. And in this dual citizenship, I must work, I must eat, I must art, I must mother, I must friend, I must listen, I must observe constantly, I must live. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip this piece in the packet, and I'm going to move on to this piece, whereas I did not desire. <clears throat> whereas, <clears throat> I did not desire in childhood to be a part of this, but desired most of all to be a part, a piece combined with others to make up a whole. Some, but not all of something. In Lakota, it's hanke, a piece or part of anything like the creek trickling behind my auntie's house where uncle built her a bridge to cross from bank to bank, not far from a grassy clearing with three teepees, a place to gather. She holds three-day workshops on traditional arts. Young people from Kyle and Potato Creek arrive one by one eager to participate. They have the option, my auntie says, to sleep at home and return in the morning, but by and large, they'll stay and camp even during South Dakota winters. The comfort of being together. I think of plains winds, snow drifts, ice and limbs, the exposure. And when I slide my arms into a wool coat, and put my hand to the doorknob, ready to brave this sub-zero dark. Someone says, be careful out there. Always consider the snow your friend. Think badly of it, snow will burn you. I walk out remembering that for millennia, we have called ourselves Lakota, meaning friend or ally this relationship to the other, some but not all, still our peace to everything. Whereas I tire of my effort to match the effort, of, and this is about language learning, so I feel so much of in, what was said in the first presentation, it rings so true even in my poems. So here we go. Whereas I tire of my effort to match the effort of the statement, Quote, and this is a direct quote from the apology, the national apology. Whereas native peoples and non-native settlers engaged in numerous armed conflicts in which unfortunately both took innocent lives, including those of women and children. I tire of engaging 
in numerous conflicts. Tire of the word both. Both as a woman and a child of that whereas. Both of words and wordplay hunching over dictionaries. Tire of understanding, weary, weakened, exhausted, reduced in strength from labor, bored. In a Lakota dictionary, that blue one right there. In a Lakota dictionary, tired is watuha, the dictionary claims. Under this entry, I find the term watuhaya, meaning to exhaust somebody or something. For example, to tire a horse by not knowing how properly to handle it. Am I watuha? Or do I, Watuchaya, I call my dad to ask and double check my findings. How do I say tired? He responds, Bluko. If you want to say really tired, it's Lila Bluko. This is my family's way the Ogallala way to say tired. And who knows better what tired is than the people? How much must I labor to signify what's real? Really, I am five feet, 10 inches. I have to say I shrunk. I just measured myself. I'm not 5'10 anymore, but anyway. <laughs> Really, I am something like 5'10". Really, I sleep on the right side of the bed. Really, I wake after eight hours and my eyes hang as slate gray squares. Really, I am beluco. Really, I climb the backs of languages, ride them into exhaustion. Maybe I pull the reins when I mean go. Maybe kick their sides when I want down. Does it matter? I'm Lila Bluco, stuck. I want off. Let loose from the impulse to note. Beware, a horse isn't a reference to my heritage. Again, for the sake of time, I'm going to actually skip, I think, the next piece. And I'm going to share some new work, work that is not in the book. Um, but I'm, I'll, I have more to talk about this new work, uh, some images and so forth. Um, so I'm going to move here. This is from a series called Obligations. And it's a series of poems I wrote for a show called uh, An Exhibit. I was in with two other Lakota artists, two other women. Uh, and the title of the show was Midakuye Oyasin. Um, and I wrote uh, actually a total of 16 poems. <clears throat> but I'm going to read a few, a few from from that exhibit. Thank you so much. It's great. <clears throat> Obligations. One. When I was young, I learned from my mother how to speak truthfully, digging stones from our chests. When I was young, I learned from my father reasons to speak carefully, digging stones from our chests. When I grew older, I taught 
my children, to whom to speak carefully, threading grasses from our chests. When I grew older, I relied on my grandchildren always to speak meaningfully, threading grasses from our chests. Two. As we embrace the future, we work to understand the grief. We shift into light across our faces. As we embrace the present, we struggle to find the grief. We wield into light across our faces as we resist the past, we begin to unbraid the grief. We wield as ash across our faces. As we resist the past, we fail to question the grief. We bury as ash across our faces. Three, as I hope to speak my heart, I remember to sing as a child, to understand, this should be our, <laughs> I'm gonna revise right here in front of you guys, our story. As I hope to change my tongue, I long to sing as a child, to understand our story. As I cease to change my eyes, I continue to sing as a mourner, to endure our story. As I cease to believe my intuition, I forget to sing as a soldier, to endure our story. I'm gonna close with this one. Four, when I gaze skyward to glint patterns, I summon the blue woman to balance to tamped size, like my relatives freely star-wise. When I gaze skyward to points of absence, I synchronize with the dried willow to balance life lessons like my relatives freely starwise. When I face the center of red hot rocks, I position to the Milky Way to balance swallowed questions as a wanderer freely Starwise. Okay, that concludes those things. I'm going to start off by talking a bit, maybe, about the poems. And maybe my stages of learning at this point. As I said uh, when I began, I am a beginner. 
I've been a beginner for a long time. <laughs> but it's only really in the last few years that I have become more, um, I think, committed to learning. And that has especially happened because of um, being a mom and realizing that it's up to me to, to be able to teach our language and um, all the values that are contained within our language, Lakota language. Um, so when I was younger, um, definitely writing poetry, working with our language through poems, through art, was a way for me to come closer. Um, as I did that, my main resources were family members. I would call up people and ask, how do I say such and such and so on, and dictionaries. Um, two summers ago, I went to um, um, the Lakota Language um, Consortium, the language camp at Sitting Bull College. Um, I don't know if you guys have heard about that. But anyway, uh, my daughter and I went to the immersion camp. Um, we, there we got a set of textbooks that looked like this, this in the, kind of in the middle there. Uh, work, uh, workbooks and textbooks and so on. We also got a new updated dictionary. Um, we've had for some years, you see on the end, flashcards. And um, also, along with that, I have discovered online this amazing, beautiful archive of classes taught by Albert Whitehat. If anyone is familiar with Albert Whitehat, he um, was a Lakota language teacher, and he developed uh, many materials in our language. One of the amazing things uh, he would do as a teacher, uh, he would record his classes and upload it online to YouTube just in case anyone was absent so that if they were absent they could get view what they missed. But what it has, what's amazing now is Albert Whitehead is gone. He passed away some years ago, a few years ago. And now we have this beautiful archive of his language classes. So that is another resource that I use. Of all those things, this, and I, so many things you said this morning resonated for me. Um, of all those things, I do not find the workbooks interesting at home. I do not find the tech, and this is just me, so this isn't applying, this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone. Um, but what I love is the videos. I love them. I love Albert Whitehat listening to him. His methodology was to teach through story. Uh, it was not grammar lessons. It was to understand the fuller picture, the fuller context of our language. So he'll start with one word sometimes and go a whole hour <laughs> and end up just telling stories that help you understand how that word is applied in our community and so forth. So I turn to his, his a lot. The other is Ocheti um, Shaklowin, Essential Understandings, a curriculum for uh, actually for K through 12, which I'm using with my daughter. And there are also videos online that include things that um, are helpful to learn our language as well. I'm gonna talk about, so that's sort of this idea of acquisition, what works and what doesn't for me. I'm gonna talk a bit about the pieces that I read and my process, a little bit about uh, pitfalls and things I've learned about language through working with it as an artist, as a writer. Um, the first poem I read, Chesapa, which is a, a poem um, dedicated to the Black Hills. Um, I started that piece, and it opens the book, of course, because Chesapa, the Black Hills, is our place of origin. 
That is what we understand as where we come from. It's the beginning. And recently, I, just for fun, I Googled the Black Hills, and I was looking up geological information. Do you know what I found out? The Black Hills is over two, dated at over two billion years old. When I read that, I mean, I felt like my head exploded. I said, two billion, that makes sense, right? That, that's where we come from. I was interested in writing that piece. The kernel of that piece actually came from a story I heard, uh, something I was told. Our original word for Black Hills was chesapa. When the settlers uh, came to, this, to that area, um, it was translated into English as Black Hills, but in our language, it is Black Mountains. And it was translated into English as Black Hills. And in more modern times, more recent times, it has been retranslated into Lakota as Pasapa, Black Hills. So you will see those two, those two phrases or word, uh, names used interchangeably. Um, and that was fascinating to me, how, how our language can change and can be impacted by this process of translation. Uh, a place as sacred as our uh, Black Hills, our place of origin, is now uh, referred to as hills, not mountains. Um, I want to talk about the other piece I read about being tired. Do you remember that piece? Okay. So that was really fun, interesting to write, and a piece in which I learned a lot. Okay. The first version of that poem Of course, I don't want to shame anybody. I don't want to say anything that gets me in trouble. But I'll, I'll be as diplomatic as possible. The first version of that poem about being tired, I used this dictionary. I wanted to write a story, a poem about um, being tired and all this process of translating and so on, uh, using dictionaries. Um, but the funny thing is, I was at a point right when I was uh, feeling embarrassed to ask, to call home and ask my family, because I'm always doing that. So I wanted to be independent, and I just wanted to use the dictionary and write it by myself on my own. So I used this dictionary, and I looked up the word for tired, and I wrote a first version of that poem. It got published, I can't even remember where, some journal. That first version of that poem got published. But what was really weird is I kept having this feeling, a nagging feeling, my intuition. I've, I'm learning to listen to my intuition. I had this feeling, I feel like maybe I should call home. I just double check. I should just double check with my dad and see if um, the term that I got from the dictionary was correct. So I called him up and I said, how do you say tired? Just as I said in the poem, I said, how do you say this? He said, blue girl, blue girl. And Lila blue girl, if you're really tired. So um, I said, oh my God, I said, that is completely different than what I got out of this dictionary. He said, who wrote that dictionary? That was his first question, and that's so typical of my family. They want to know who. Who did it? Where did you hear that from? So I looked in the front, and I told him who. And he said, I know that guy. He's an old missionary. He said, I know who did that. He said, 
I, I, again, I don't want to say anything that's not, that'll get me into trouble, but basically my dad said, I don't think that guy knew what he was talking about at all. <laughs> and then next thing he said was, was that dictionary, was it uh, from Dakota language first? Is it taken from Dakota? I looked in the front and indeed it was. So it was uh, derived from Dakota vocabulary and then turned into Lakota dictionary. He knew it right away because the language is, is inside him, right? Of course, he, he, could, he, he knew it. I said, oh my God, you're so right. So I said, forget it. I'm never using this thing again. So, uh, but it's still an interesting resource. I don't really depend on it. But through writing that poem, and that process, and making a mistake. The first version was published. Making a mistake, still, I learned from it. And I learned an important lesson. I have learned, first and foremost, I trust my family and the speakers in our communities, uh, in our community. First and foremost, they're the experts, not any of these books any of these materials, because those materials are compiled by particular people. And you really don't know for sure uh, maybe who they're gathering information from or what have you. So for me, uh, I trust the people from my community, my family, my region, our way of using language, Oglala way of, of using language. I'm gonna move on now, actually, to the last series of poems, the um, diamond-shaped poems, and talk to you a bit about um, those pieces. Uh, as I said, they were part of um, an exhibit called Midakuye Oyasin, uh, and I worked with two other Lakota artists, two women. Uh, we organized this show, this exhibit, because we were actually interested in that phrase, how many people, I'm, I bet a number of you have heard that phrase before. Okay, so it is something that um, many people use and have adopted, and if I can be so bold, they have appropriated it. So that phrase is used a lot, but people don't always understand the deeper meaning. So what we have found, me and my friends Mary and Clementine Bordeaux, uh, we found that it seems mm, in more recent times a lot of people use that phrase to create familiarity. Midakuya uh, oyasin means all my relatives or we are all related. And they will hear people toss it around as a way to sort of just create familiarity uh, or inclusion, but they have not really, they do not really understand what it means to be a relative. What it means to say we are related. I am your relative in Lakotu uh, perspective. Because to say I am a relative, to be a relative is something that we take seriously. So what we decided is we wanted to do a show on this, what it is, what that really means. So uh, Clementine, uh, Clementine Bordeaux is a um, documentary, she studied documentary film. So she went to a number of um, uh, people in our, women in our community and interviewed them about what this, uh, what this means to them to get a deeper understanding of Midakuya Oyasi. Uh, Mary made some sculptures and I wrote some poems, but I did not want to just put the poems on the page. Uh, I wanted the poems to speak to our community. I didn't feel like, uh, I couldn't imagine people from our community just coming and looking at an eight and a half by 11 white piece of paper. I wanted it, I wanted to communicate through material. So what I did was, thank you. What I did was um, 
I took a pattern. Do you guys know what star quilts are? I took a star quilt pattern uh, one of my cousins gave me, and I enlarged it. And I enlarged the diamonds to one foot long each. And um, I took these poems that you saw in the diamond shape, and I laser cut, or I had it done, laser cut the, the text into those diamonds out of paper. And I sewed them together with copper wire. And I made a conceptual star quilt out of paper and wire. So I'm going to show you, this was a beginning. It's hard to see. It's not the best image. But this is the beginning stage at home at my kitchen table. Many hours of watching Netflix and sitting there <laughs> laboring over this. Um, so that's one of the one of the poems, one of the sections of the star that I started doing. Um, and it's, the white spaces are where the text is cut out. I'll jump to the finished product. In the end, uh, put together, and when I finally put, sewed it all together, and I made two stars, this is obligations, the one that I read from. Um, these were 12 foot high by 12 foot wide. So this is obligations. The one on the left is called mosquitoes because mosquitoes are our relatives to whether we like it or not, right? We all have some mosquitoes in our life. This is a man standing to give you a sense of scale. So. Standing there reading it. Um, that's a closer look at the mosquitoes one I stenciled in, um, little mosquitoes. And then it has text. You can't really see it, but I hand wrote the text for um, that piece instead of laser cutting. These are two sculptures that Mary did, Mary Bordeaux. Um, so one is a buffalo skull. And one is a rock, because rocks, stones are our, our relatives too. Um, so she made those, and she suspended them from the ceiling. Um, and what you can do as a viewer, you can come into the gallery and put those on top of your head. And she installed little screens inside and with Clementine's interviews. So you can put that on your head and view, um, listen and watch those interviews. So there you are, there's two people with uh, putting them on and, and listening to uh, these interviews about Midakuye Oyasin. Here's a porcupine she made on the wall. She had a speaker with interviews inside of it and you had to come really close to the sculpture to hear it. Uh, this is inside the stone sculpture. What it looked, when you put, put it on your head, she had woven uh, sweet grass inside and there you see the screen. So when you put it on your head, you could smell the sweet grass and you could watch, so it was all of a full experience. Oh, and this is us. That's uh, Clementine on the left, and that's Mary um, there on the right, and me. I was working up to the last minute. I meant, I meant to dress nicely for the exhibit, and I had no time to even change, so I was in my jeans and t-shirt. But in any case, that, that's us. So um, what I wanted to say about that is that was also, that exhibit was a process of deepening. Uh, deepening from one phrase, we, we, this took a year. We worked on this for a year. All of those poems I read, I um, wrote, I listened to hours and hours and hours of interview that um, Clementine had done. 
and other uh, community members on this, just this phrase of midakuye oyasin, what it means to be a relative in Lakota philosophy. Um, and that includes the stars. I have a poem dedicated to the stars and the star shape um, and so on. I only have a few minutes left. I have five minutes left, so I have so much I wish I could say. I have much more written down, but I'm actually just going to maybe close then with looking towards the future. This coming summer, my daughter and I are going to go back to Lakota language camp uh, up in Standing Rock. Um, and we're going to do beginning class again um, because we skipped a year and we, we lost track. And I'm okay with that. I don't mind it. I want to go do beginning again. I don't mind. There's no time rush. And I want to... Um, well, that's just my intuition. I think that it would be a good idea. Um, one thing I have come to is uh, sort of a feeling, I feel like ultimately to be at the level of speaking and I want to say sensibility, a Lakota sensibility that I wish to um, be closer to. I feel personally I cannot do it living here in Santa Fe or far away. I feel like I need to be there in the community where it's heard and spoken and we use it and we absorb it through all the senses. And language is not a book. That is the biggest lesson I have learned. It comes from our family, our community. So at some point I think I do and I have set my sights toward this we will uh, go back, we will live on Pine Ridge. Uh, that's gonna take some time because I have things to do in the meantime. But that is my vision. Um, but in the meantime, I want to close just with a little story. Despite my beginning level, despite my mistakes, despite my fumbling, as I said, I began this process, I began to take it seriously when I became a mother. So much of this has to do with uh, my child and um, giving her what I feel she needs as she grows um, into who she is as a young woman. Despite all of that, she does give me hope. So I'm gonna close with this little story. Uh, we were living on the Navajo Nation, on Diné Nation, for uh, some years since she was really little. Her dad is Diné. But uh, we moved, Chance and I moved here to Santa Fe last, back to Santa Fe last year. So she went to city school for the first time. And man, I was really nervous because she was uh, at school out there um, all the way up to fifth grade, and it was a new school. I said, oh my goodness, uh, I hope she does okay. Um, but she did, she just fit right, she slid right in, she made friends and so on. So anyway, I've been traveling a lot because of this book, because of reading and so on. So I had to go on a trip a little while back. Um, I had to go on a trip and it happened that while I was gone at her school, they had a culture, like some kind of cultural day or something, and they asked all the kids to come in and do a presentation. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not gonna be there. I wanted to be there to help her, to instruct her, tell her what to do, and so on. Um, so I gave her some ideas, right? Um, but when I came back, I went into her room. I came back from the trip. She'd already had cultural day. I went into her room and I saw the materials that she took to class um, and the presentation she made. She had a stack of family pictures 
family photos that go all the way back to Long Soldier, our great-great-grandpa. That would be her great-great-great-grandpa. All the way back to Long Soldier, to her great-grandma, my grandma Sha, uh, her grandpa, my dad, and me. She had a stack of family pictures. She took that in. Then she had a stack of uh, about 20 animals. And I came to my mom. I said, how did her presentation go? My mom was like, you will not believe this. She said, she did it all on her own. So what she did was, apparently, Grandma said, she went to the computer um, all by herself. Grandma didn't, nobody helped. She printed out 20 uh, animals, and she wrote at the top of each picture uh, the word in Lakota, the Lakota name for each animal. She took that to class in our, our family pictures. And she's in the back of the room, so she can correct me if I'm wrong. Now she's hiding, sorry. <laughs> but in any case, she took those family pictures and she gave a presentation on on language and fluency and, and why it is so important for us to learn language. Then she passed out those pictures to her classmates and she played a language game with them. She played a game to help them learn, her friends to learn how, learn a little of our language. Lastly, all by herself, um, the night before, she made a, a big pot of wojapi, which is like a kind of a berry pudding or dessert. And she took that in after they were done with the game and um, fed everybody, gave them a little taste of, a, of something from our back home. And she did this by herself, and that was the most beautiful thing to me because I realized that she has at least the enthusiasm to learn and to carry on our language. Uh, I will definitely be with her learning, but she can stand on her own too. You know, that, um, yeah, she's the next generation going forward. So um, that is what I'm going to end with because of time. But thank you so much, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here.